Uh, I would probably separate it between uh, profiling the person. So, um, for the vast majority of people, just uh, starting at zero would be fine. It's a it's the balance of both. So zero Kiwami one and two is a balance of both. Basically the the streamlined standards between Yakuza Zero is a streamlined standard between Kiwami one and Kiwami two. And then uh then that's a great place to start. Like to answer the question where to start, Yakuza Zero is the best of the compromise of both. So Yakuza 0, Kiwami 1 and 2. And maybe even Kiwami 1, Yakuza 0, and then Kiwami 2. If you like the idea of having the reverse impression. Because uh, Kiwami 1 and Yakuza 0 are very dependent on each other. On Majima's perspective. So whichever one you want to initiate on. If you want the kooky stuff, Kiwami 1 is a good start to... Un uh, Ex first expose yourself to Majima's that Majima and then Yakuza 0 would take you back and hit you differently with Majima or the other way around you get hit differently with Majima and then become Majima yeah I prefer me personally I prefer having an origin story before seeing the consequences of that origin story you know like the I am not a mechanical person. I do not like when character. I don't find it unique when characters stay dynamically. Uh, like not stay static in their ways, which Yakuza Zero shows a coming of age origin story for Majima. Then Majima assumes it becomes an enigma, and he stays in an enigma. And then he became a plot device. Yakuza 3, 4, and 5, he ends up becoming a plot device instead. So when it comes to introducing one of the biggest characters in this series, probably playing Kiwami 1 first, then Yakuza 0, and, and then Kiwami 2. And it progresses in that order technologically as well. So it'll give you an idea of the RGG progression. Kiwami 1 is the re uh, remake but it's also the one closest in design to the original rgg vision then yakuza 0 is the interface between yakuza 5 which is too much of everything just lots and lots so they cut it in half basically half they cut all the locations and stuff in half and then they streamlined and made the story more focused on two characters instead of just one, right? So um, then that's a streamlined gold standard. And then Kiwami 2 is a leap into the dragon engine. Uh, alternatively, you could play Kiwami 1, Yakuza 0, then Yakuza 6 and watch the events of 3, 4, 5. I would just add Yakuza 6 to it. So I would do Kiwami 1, Yakuza 0, Kiwami 2 as a compromise for the post Dragon Engine, then watch for most modern gamers these days, like anywhere, anyone who's used to modern standards, watch essays on 345 and then play Yakuza 6 and then jump into the modern standard which is all the post yakuza 6 stuff 345 is something that require it's a niche thing 345 i actually weigh a lot heavier but i'm a niche person i an older gamer and all that uh these um three is the beginning of a vision that's different from the first three games so like kiwami one with the remakes one and two yakuza zero and yakuza six and on are the modern standards it's getting close to the modern standards that make rgg great like what i mean by great is what people are saying like this game saved rgg or this game saved the series it's the breakout mainstream thing three four five would be 
a different vision. It was a vision that they went away from. Uh, like, to me, that's when their vision started deviating towards trying to balance being internationally receptive, receiving, than not. 345 was going really hands up hard on unapologetic design. And as much as this is a selfish request, I like un unapologetic development. But people do not buy that stuff. They do not buy that stuff. It's too hardcore. It becomes gatekeeping. So if I had to uh, rely on something, when any game series turns into a gatekeeping game series, you can watch lots of video essays because people will explain that part. Uh, it, it's a natural compensation for people not willing to want to experience it or play it. So you can probably fill in the gaps of 345 really rapidly. If it gets remade, it would be brought up to some sort of modern standard of whatever time it is. So if they eventually get remade, a lot of the... It might get trimmed down. It might get streamlined because of modern standards. So 345 represents... Uh, which I'm playing for. And my thoughts... This is going to be part of the review. You thought... What? The 345 remastered? They were... What? I don't remember in which context it was. But uh, 345 represents a vision that they used to have before they had to compromise. In my opinion, they decide to do some compromising things that made them a breakout uh, develop developer, in my opinion. It, the 345 would be the least li likely to be talked about. A modern, oh yeah. Yakuza 0 is the modernization of, it is the one that most people would say saved RGG, as in uh, saved the series from staying niche, basically not reaching a global audience, not breaking out in any way, and introducing the stuff. 345 is a gatekeeper, so you have to open the gates, you have to be in it to open the gates. If you can't open the gates, you skip 345. You learn tangentially and at a distance how to appreciate 345. It is before the gates are shut tight on 345. Uh, my analogy, I was going to come up with an analogy for this. It's like, uh, what's another game series? Like, uh, for example, if you like Final Fantasy games, right? Uh, Seven is Yakuza Zero. Final Fantasy Seven is Yakuza Zero. Uh, gatekeepers, uh, like uh, um, leaning into it, like maybe Kiwami One is Final Fantasy Three slash Six, and then every other fantasy before Seven out of three slash six depending on east or west it's like a, the whole like a dragon versus yakuza thing out of three or six everything else is gatekeeping so uh it's behind the gate so you don't have to play any of them and it's even less because there's less legacy in final fantasy all the stories are it's the legacy is the mechanics of final fantasy uh square enix build mechanics and vi like conceptual vision and direction, but not necessarily story and legacy. But there's, I don't think there are other ones that I could. Like for Zelda, if you're a Zelda person, um, Yakuza Zero would be Ocarina of Time. Not, is it? Yeah, Ocarina of Time. And then. Uh, Kiwami 2 and Yakuza 6 would be more like uh, post. It uh, those those are more like uh, Breath of the Wild now, but the gatekeeping ones are all the things in between, the OG, Zelda, 
ex especially. And then when you hit really hard, Yakuza 3 is like Twilight Princess or Majora's Mask. It's a hidden gem in the sense that gatekeepers would appreciate it. Because if they entered the gate already, they're in deep. And you go deep into like Majora's Mask. Or even Link 2, for that matter. The Adventures of Link <laughs> 2, Zelda 2, the side-scrolling one. That's kind of how to equate to that. So 345, this is my jam. Like, I'm in my element here. 345 is where I invest. This is how I break into the gate. Like, get behind the gate. Figure out what's behind the gate. And in Yakuza 0, scroll back. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like the... When it becomes mainstream, right? And the mainstream is Yakuza 0. The most mainstream. You have an elegance. It's like, great. Like, it's, it's a... It's having a really great balance between your palettes. So, it's not in so hard that you don't get it. Being a prequel, right? It's even situated as a prequel so you don't require any legacy to get into it even though technically from a creative standpoint chronologically is a, a cognitive bias because there's always going to be a before and an after when you're talking about linear story like like the life of a linear creature time frame there's always a before and after but subconsciously when something doesn't exist as a creative process it counts as the beginning so Yakuza 0 is in the beginning. So no legacy required. That gate is not even there. It's not even possible intellectually for most people. Um, to me, Yakuza 0 is not Yakuza negative 1. Right? So for me, any of the pieces can be evaluated individually based on their merits. In my opinion. Because I'm a niche person. So there's no barrier of gate of entry. I could start at Yakuza 3 if I wanted. But I didn't out of convenience just that way so my order would be start at zero and go on if you wanted to portray yourself as following the storyline my priority is following the storyline at first but in terms of development and stuff the opus mac like I forgot, I keep changing the phrase I think it's magnus opus or the opus magnus uh, Opus Magnum, uh, Magnus of the RGG is Yakuza 5. Then they streamlined. They totally streamlined. They cut back from 5. I mean, Yakuza 0 could have had 6 characters. They could have just went super deep. Like Square Enix did with Octopath Traveler. They could have just went super ham. Uh, like, uh, Yakuza Like a Dragon has a lot of characters, but... It got streamlined to one mainline uh, protagonist again, right? So it keeps streamlining, but find different ways of introducing more and more characters. And turn-based games are essentially that. They are character collectors. And that is an ingenious way of compromising between the vision that they had for Yakuza 5 and where they're going to go. Or making it bigger and more interconnected. That's why, in my opinion, most people will focus, oh, it's turn-based. It affects my core mechanics a lot. But generally speaking, turn-based games make room for incredible number of characters. And you can really make them identifiable because you can focus on the nuances with that type of game layout. Not so much if you're trying to do this, because it, it get, becomes incredibly unbalanced, as most people like to say, uh, when it comes to character design. Like, for example, this game, Yakuza 4, there are people on the Akiyama train, there are people on the Tanamura chain, and they constantly compare each character on their balance and contribution to the whole product. When really you're comparing zero, it's like, you either have the character or you don't have the character. That is the perspective of a development cycle 
or game that has to create separate playing experiences for characters. They either make the cut or they don't. It's not which character was their favorite out of the four. You're talking about cutting a character for another character. Well, in most modern standards, you keep the best character and have everything complement the best character. So, um, after Yakuza 5, which features five characters, it gets trimmed to two for more focused, intimate, focused, like, I said focus twice, intimate look at two characters, which is Kiryu and Majima in Yakuza 0. Then they reduced it to 1.5 characters in Yakuza 6. And in Yakuza Like a Dragon 7, one core character. But in the meantime, though, the Judgment series try to retain that too, but it's still just one character. And then a DLC focuses on one character, but a different character. So what they're doing now is they're adhering to the modern standard where you keep focus. It's less distracting. It's a really big minus in this day and age to ever recommend, in my opinion, recommend storytelling like Yakuza 4 or 5. It is a niche area. Those games that make the niche storytelling where it features lots of characters and you always have to abandon your sentimentalism and then start over with a new character, constantly doing that over and over again, it makes it a very fragmented experience. But those games that do that knock it out of the park because they have to do so much right to be successful in a niche group. Because there are very high standards that are required to succeed in a small market. So Octopath Traveler is a great series example of that type of storytelling that is mainstream-ish enough that is making money. But it is it pales in comparison to another game that features one character. And you just center around that grown character. And that character has to be the universal likeness of as many players as possible so that people would buy the game. Because empathy is one of the biggest sellers, right? So what do those characters look like in video games? They're beyond human. They have rarely any flaws. If they have flaws, they're redeemed. Because you have to make people want to play the character. If you have one character, it, it has to appeal to a lot of things. When you have multiple characters, you're going to only certain characters are going to appeal to certain characters. And what does that do? It creates a fragmented loss of value in the game. So, for example, in this game, uh, if you give it to a modern standard gamer who has expectations, he, um, he's, the person will likely say Akiyama is great. It resonates with most people because Akiyama is a dream character. He is a character that is legitimately larger than life and very positive forward. The moment you use Saijima, you're going to lose like 20 to 30 percent of the players who don't like like how stubborn he is or how broody he is. And then when you hit Tanamura, you're going to lose another 40 percent because Tanamura is kind of as a play style that's very defensive. And and then when you hit Kiryu, it's like, all right, it's pretty all right. But, you know, he he's not as cool as Akiyama. So generally speaking, any game that has multiple characters it allows the developer to create actual human beings, in my opinion. They are more likely to create dynamic characters because there's less room. It's ironic. I know this is counterintuitive. If you focus on one character, it leaves a lot of room to develop them and make them dynamic. But what they can't do is they can't make the character non-empathetic. Like, you cannot make a character that strays too far to an extreme because if you had to play that character the entire game and you hate how extreme they are, you'll never finish the game. You don't want to see it ever. So to me, 
this type of storytelling has failed. Like, it has failed the modern standard. Like, it does not... So, it becomes niche, basically. If you're making a character that isn't all around a good guy, all around redeemable, all around being able to turn into the thing you want the character to be, basically choice matters kind of stuff, like make him a good guy if you feel like being a good guy, make him a bad guy if you feel like you're a little naughty, you know, kind of thing. If it doesn't empathize, that game is going to sell poorly because the center figure, you can't relate to it. So this game inherently, Yakuza 4, and specifically Yakuza 4, is a big risk. The more characters you have, the more likely that percentage of the game will be at risk of loss. So when you're a niche person, you're looking for variety. You're looking for things that isn't pandering to you. So that's why I love these games specifically, and I consider myself an unpopular, opinionated gamer because I like being disgusted or seeing things that are incomplete or damaged people or things that we kind of want to get away from in video games. So when, if you're a person who goes to video games to escape, for example, everything that character is, is probably everything you wish you were. The more you become attached to a video game's protagonist that is larger than life, is pretty much embodying your dreams. You want to be that character, and that's great. I, I think that's very healthy for people to escape using that. I just don't play video games for escapism because I'm really happy. I'm like a person who is worldly enough to know I prefer my characters being uh, interesting takes on actual characters. I'm not running away from real life when I play video games. I want to live the life that I don't get to live. So I want developers to tell their story through the game because I cannot live their life which are real life you know like it's a projection of themselves what other people can't see in my opinion when they're escaping on gaming is it mars the way their mindset does when this game is garbage it's not lining up with their logic or their execution it's garbage so they're not looking for empathy they're looking for pandering the modern gamer, in my opinion, is super receptive to that because they want to live a fantasy. They want to feel good, to feel powerful, feel magnanimous, or feel like they can do anything in a video game. And that sells, and it's great. I'm just not a person who's looking to escape my own real life. I just want to see other people's real life, their work and stuff. So when someone says, is there enough content, like in a different context, it's like, well, it's enough content for those people who are making the game for you. It's never going to be enough for you because the game is a projection of them. Go play a mainstream game. That's, that's, if you want enough content, if you want to feel good, if you want to have high value, play a game from a developer it's more of a more it's in this case it's actually more important to understand the publisher because the executives because if they value their gaming audience like the money if they value you as a player a prospective customer more the product will sell itself because it's pandering to you it's trying to draw you in when a game tries to push me away like Hey guys, like, I know, I know. Hear me out. This game's not for everyone. It's kind of kooky. Like, I know you've never played a game like this. Are you willing to buy the game and trust me? You bet I would. Because I'm not looking for a game that tells me what I like. I want a game that tells me what I, what the developer think I might like. Because it's not an interesting it's not interesting at all exploring myself. 
I'm not there to make myself feel better. I already feel pretty great about myself in general. So this is it. Like <clears throat> when doing Tanamora, most people would stop here. I think 70 to 80 percent of players aren't going to finish this game because it ends right here. When they reach Tanamura, the game just ends. <clears throat> and they never get to Kiryu, and they'll just watch a video for the rest of the stuff. Yakuza 3? None of the sub-stories. Actually, I think most people probably quit after the first boss fight with Rikia. They might quit before Rikia. <clears throat> they will definitely quit after Tamashiro. Like I would say 70 to 80 percent of the players would stop playing the game after after Tamashiro, which is only like five hours into the game. If you skip pretty much everything that most people don't care about because people don't care about other people's lives. It's they don't care about it's kind of ironic because one of the selection factors for these games is that you have to be interested in Japanese culture, right? But I actually think because it is a Japanese, it's Jap incredibly Japanese that those people demonstrate just how little they care about the Japanese culture. They care about the game, like the, how the game plays. They don't care about the intellectual side of things, which is what I'm discussing here. I'm, I am playing the game right now. Just discussing this thing is part of what makes this game interesting to me. The idea that you can talk about these things, this design choice. And because if I play a mainline game, right, I don't have to explain much. It's a main, it's a mainstream game. So. All the games I play, including these, are not yet mainstream. Like, I still can't consider this mainstream. So, I have yet to get to a mainstream. Yakuza 0 is the least explanator, uh, explain, explanation that I have to make. So, if someone catches me playing Yakuza 0, I don't have to explain much. It's like, what is this game about? It's about two characters who are on a path of redemption. And they have ups and downs, but they're really likable characters. Like, what does the gameplay like? It plays like a street brawler that you would probably imagine. Because it's refined enough to be a memorable experience to people who can relate in the mainstream. What does Yakuza 3 play like? And then you have gatekeepers come out of the woods. Or all the people who quit playing. Like, oh, I didn't really like the blocking thing and whatnot. Or... Wow, he's so jank, he moves like a tank, and you didn't have much tools. I said all those things. I said all those things because they're facts. I didn't say those things because I hate it. I, I absolutely love that the game did that. Because I would have done the exact same thing that I did for the last three games. Or actually just the last game. So every one of these games, you just do a different thing. And it's great. Uh, these are sequels. But the only thing that connects their sequels are the assets and like the mechanical stuff like some of the legacy of the mechanical stuff and even then you'll know that doing the same thing they made it loose enough that if you do the same thing it's largely still successful you can still brute force it doing and they had to consider that but to do the clever things it's slightly different and it's gonna look the same so this is where the gatekeeping comes in, right? Uh, someone will see someone play Yakuza 4 and 5 and they would say, Oh, it's the same thing. Like, it, it looks the same. It's like, yeah, it does look the same. But it doesn't. It's not. It's, it's incredibly different. But that's the finer details, right? The, the devil's in the details. And that's what makes it a gatekeeping experience. You cannot superficially demonstrate to anyone that the game is different. And it's kind of the same as like live service games. Someone who quits right away and asks you, should I return to this game? 
Well, if you quit right away, you might as well not return to this game. You have no way of even having the proper mindset or commitment to it. You literally phrased your question and inquiry as though you wanted me to tell you not to return to the game. It's not a mainstream game. I, I think it's been a while. <sighs> now that I think about it, I don't remember which game I played when it was mainstream. The closest game that I can say that I played that it is now mainstream is Hades. Super Giant Games. But I played it well before it was mainstream. It's kind of like uh, watching an Academy Award movie, right? And then it gets the Academy Award and then now everyone's interested in it. So I haven't been in a position where I should be playing Diablo 4 right now, basically, right? So, and unfortunately, I would love to like something mainstream, but it hasn't, the opportunity hasn't come yet. To relate it back to Yakuza though, I hope this becomes mainstream and I can talk about it. That'd be great. And I hope I don't become a gatekeeper. <laughs> like what I mean is I don't, ha I hope I don't inadvertently become a toxic gatekeeper which can happen because it's an emotional process so basically um someone say oh can you tell me about the other games because i really like yakuza uh or like a dragon 8 maybe uh next year right yakuza uh like a dragon 8 is like hey can you tell me about the, the old old games and i was like all right here and then i become very overwhelming and then the guy would be like uh, that seems like a lot of work. And then I would like be a defensive or something by saying more about the games. That's basically the pattern of gatekeeping. You become so emotionally invested that it sounds like you're just constantly defending, but you have so much baggage. There's so much behind it. And I'm already doing that to some extent already for like Yakuza 4 and 5 and 3. It's an emotional, it's like that's the human condition. This is where he meets Akiyama. Have a little powwow. They sort it out. They talk about uh, Yashiko. Anyways, refocusing. It's just a slight digression, but it's very relevant to RGG's position right now. They get caught up. Both of them exchange intels on the Yashiko and Saijima and Kataragi thing. At this point, Tanamura doesn't know who Kido is. Akiyama just walks to the side and talks about Kido. And then now he introduces what Kido is doing. We're just looking at it after Arai. And then Tanamura is filling in that uh, Arai is working for Katsuragi oh. now. And Shibata is dead. Yep, there it is. Yep, there it is. So... This is where they look for the second Ueno Sewa clan member who survived. Arai shot the other guy. And then we go to the docks and entrap uh, Sugiuchi. <clears throat> Mishima. Mishima is his name. There's no way I would have remembered that, unfortunately. I have my hearts sort of set on the idea that maybe uh, this game, uh, this franchise, like this game series, is going to be my ticket into um, being hip with the kids. But at the same time, be like a resident sleeper gatekeeper <laughs> status. I do the thing like. Well, you know, here's an interesting trivia about Like a Dragon 8 that comes from Kiwami 1, you know, like that kind of thing. Just something interesting.
it's difficult to know though because um it's not yet on the level of truly mainstream and the downside about truly mainstream stuff is it comes with the brutal expectations of the modern gamer and the modern gamer is not friendly is very not friendly and what i mean by not friendly i mean they just have very self-centered standards and when you have a bunch of people with self-centered standards it's incredibly hard on a developer and with the pressure the full force of an executive organization pushing them to make the most likable universally likable thing yeah they have no foundations in reality yeah especially one that is um and it's exceptionally true when the standards are based on individualism right because reality the reality is we are a collective when products are made products are sold it's a collective however the standards are built on individual desires so the more that is set up for a brand rgg hopefully is not communicating that in my opinion it actually works against their design they could decide to change their design which is slowly changing right um their direction to me that would be a loss in identity but at the same time it would be a gain in safety it would be a gain in design that caters to a mass audience because the last thing you want to see is like a fall from grace which happens quite often with their break into mainstream so for example uh uh yakuza like a dragon which is number seven what made a controversial change and the gatekeepers came out to take a dunk on turn-based gaming that is a compromise between being the most reasonably approachable mechanically wise while trying to maintain the highest quantity of character designs and character uh variety right so what I saw was a company, uh, a developer group that made the risk of balancing, making it accessible and still having enough of the old identity to not have the gatekeepers bury the game. And now what they're doing is they're running parallel sequel, uh, parallel uh, projects one that caters to the old beat em up form formation which is like a dragon gaiden which was really uh, announced and i have no reservations or hesitations that like a dragon 8 is going to continue the higher accessible design that is allowing more people to enjoy their products but at the same time it also welcomes more criticism with more and more entrance the more popular it becomes the more individualized perspectives that you have to cater to as a great example of how legacy has fallen and bit developers is the dichotomy between individuals who have to review variety of things versus a consumer that only buys into selective things that would be any game with a long legacy Diablo 4 is a great example. Street Fighter 6 is a great example. If you look at it, there's going to be a dichotomy. The difference between someone who has to do it for a profession that evaluates multiple things, i.e. the critics as a group, and then players who simply are looking for the same thing. And a very specific same thing. If it's repetitive and similar and non-novel, but it doesn't cater to them, it's unacceptable. It's absolutely a zero out of 10. But if it's exactly what they want and it's basically nothing new, it's a 10 out of 10. So the bipolarness of that reflects the modern standards. And some part of me say that I think RGG is up to it. Like this studio is up to it. 
but it will ultimately be a burden, in my opinion, to create for a larger audience. And that's the compromise, because what is their compensation? They get more production costs, more time, money, right? So it's the compensation for having to deal or having to circumvent that or find a compromise. Um, what's the other alternative? The, the creators leave and go back to the niche scene. So uh, to talk about RGG, two of the founders or two of the mainstay creators and the one founder, Nagoshi, left like on mutual terms, uh, I would suspect at least that's the impression. And he just decided to create his own studio to, you know, continue making his different ideas, his niche ideas or whatever direction they want. And often the gamer would compare it to like, oh, this is basically like a dragon. Like most people will say like, oh, Nagoshi is probably going to make a, like a dragon clone, but slightly different. Like that's, that makes all the difference in the creative process. Like Callisto Protocol got reamed outside of the technical things for creative limitations. It's like, but that that is the difference. That the nuances of the different approaches is why it doesn't cater to a mass audience. And how did Callisto Protocol perform? Well, it's everyone who assumed the mainstream expectations and thrown onto a niche game. That's, that's what happens, right? So you want to divorce yourself from the legacy because that legacy will create dissonance. Um, a clever way is usually to introduce another title to it. It's usually sufficient, right? So the Judgment series and the this game had a spinoff, the Judgment series and uh, Lost Judgment. And they divorced itself enough, even though mechanically, some people will say on the surface, like, oh, it's the same. It's like, well, what is the meat of Like a Dragon games? They're protagonists. They're characters. It's not the same in, in uh, Judgment and Lost Judgment. It's like, well, yeah, sure, that guy's a detective. Yagami is a detective. It's like... That makes all the difference. It's the nuance. That's why they had creative differences. That's why it doesn't go under the title of Like a Dragon. Right? That's the... If you understand RGG enough and their legacy, you get to have a more realistic expectation and realistic standard. But generally speaking, in my opinion, the vast majority of gamers are more concerned about how they feel as opposed to what the developer is trying to tell them or trying to experience reading books is it's not a thing anymore because if you read a book the old school books they are not about how uh, trying to get you to have a profound realization about yourself in the way that panders to you books don't pander like classic books don't pander they tell you what is on the mind of the person who wrote the book. And that's what inspires you to do things. If you spend most of your time playing video games and thinking about how you feel about things, eh, you're not really learning anything new, to be honest. Not, not com disproportionately compared to uh, trying to learn what the developers are trying to do. It is so much exponentially harder and much more... Uh, you're able to extract much more information when you try to do that. And sometimes it's just so hard that usually escapism doesn't accommodate that. It, escapism, like from real life to relieve stress and stuff, that's a self-help kind of thing. So it's very cathartic, and I understand that. I can't recommend these games for that type of person. Because... Uh, there are, in, in the terms of the goal of what the purpose of a video game is, to, I would say, 80 to 90% of people who spend money is that the money must pander to that value. So if a, a, a gamer buys 60 bucks, the developer has to 
pander to them to convince them their pandering is worth 60 bucks. Not when you watch a movie and it's an awful experience, but it is still 20 bucks. Right? Whether you like it or not, that's not the intent. It is 20 bucks because that was the cost of that they determined was the value of their work in a way that's sustainable. Right? So my goal often is not whether this game is worth 60 bucks is if they told something uh that that's a little hard to raise like if i feel like it's worth 60 bucks i'm trying to figure out what they feel is 60 bucks and then i can understand what their next games are going to be and the game after that i can better begin to understand what the creators think is 60 bucks um my uh the lots of influencers do the thing where like oh yeah 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 so this game is totally not worth 60 bucks is that you think this game is totally not worth 60 bucks there's no argument at all that the developers and executives agree that this is worth 60 bucks. So most reviewers, in my opinion, is trying to cater to mainstream thought, which is the consumer determines the value of the product. It's like, no, they don't. Actually, logically, the value of the product is already determined before you actually review the product. So what is a bigger challenge that's interesting? Figuring out why they think this is 60 bucks. In, in my opinion, obviously, I have an unpopular opinion. My favorite thing about experiencing things is I want to know why you think this is 15 bucks. Like if you told me you can offer me a service for 10 bucks and you can do all that stuff, I want to know why you think and if I can see it in their product, if I can see why they uh, decided that is supposed to be 15 bucks instead of do I think it's 15 bucks? I'm going to be honest. If you ask that question to yourself long enough, the answer is always free. What I mean is after you ask that question about yourself, what is it worth? enough times it's going to be it can always be free and even free things will eventually become it's not worth it how many times do you hear that all the time it's like well this game has a paywall or this game has uh what else do i have to pay for here it's like you don't pay for anything you actually play so when you play it's like oh i can't play this because there's money on it it's like well yeah but you already played some like your frame of mind is that you must be able to pay play something before you pay for it i mean have you created something and what you do is uh, to make money you give away your product to as many people as possible and have them voluntarily choose that they want to pay you just ask yourself if you can do that. I I certainly find I I would be very it's very with great reservation, but probably pretty safe that to say that most people can't even flip the script and say that with confidence and put their money where their mouth is. So when you start reviewing a product, I would say a really wonderful review would be to have both the consumer's perspective and the consumer's perspective in an attempt to understand the creator's perspective. So it is far more interesting when you start comparing and contrasting. Do my personal experiences and my value system line up with the developers and the executives? If you get a sponsorship, it's not about the money they pay you. It's about if you trust the product and stand by the product. That's my personal opinion. I would love that. And if RGG were to say, 
hey, would you represent your product? And I would be like, yes, absolutely. As long as you're not pandering to mainstream people. Because they don't represent my perspective on things. If you continue to represent your unadulterated vision, that is what I stand for, in my opinion. I want creators to not be restricted by the constant selfish requirements of other people. And unfortunately, that's just not practical, right? It's a standard that's not bound in reality. People pay, uh, people pay for what they want, usually. That's the easiest way. That's the lowest effort to get what they want. I don't want, like, even I can't say I don't want to pay $100 for a bad steak. Right? So that's fair. Just saying, though. In terms of creative products, it's a really tough, tough ask for me to try to... Um, mainstream products like why don't I play mainstream products and see if I can do the same thing is it's a diffusion of responsibility I don't have to defend main mainstream products they speak for themselves right so if you ever want to really be like the goats right have opinions that reflect mainstream like YouTube be a great content creator you play mainstream games and not because they are popular and people want to hear your opinion is that you can get into the mindset of the mainstream games like playing mainstream games conditions you to have a mainstream thought process a mainstream mindset over time it will normalize that and because of that when you do those things you resonate and more people will resonate with you because the experiences overlap so how do you become popular intuitively for mainstream series? Play a Souls game. Inherently, you will have more people resonate with you, even without thinking about it, strategically. without. So it's kind of like um, if you can't beat them, join them kind of situation, but from a psychological perspective. You inherently, naturally intuit people's feelings better if you're experiencing the same things and like what i mean is yes yeah, so you can differ like in a very gatekeepy way like really deep down but on the surface level if you like mainstream games it makes you mainstream mindset and it creates togetherness so i am now officially pandering to a niche group and pandering to a niche group does not carry weight so niche people, those who have niche thoughts, like selective thoughts and eccentricity, they rarely ever go into a feedback loop in which they convince themselves that gaslighting people about their own personal stuff is reality. So for example, if you're always doing mainstream stuff, eventually you'll collectively resonate with more people. It gives you the thought that what you say becomes facts about evaluation about valuation and in general but things that are objectively true accurate and false is not depend on how popular it is that's where the dissonance come from so then you get to the point where i'm really popular lots of people resonate with me so what i say is probably really true and worth a lot of value for the reality of the things it's like Mm, yes and no it is worth a lot to a lot of people it doesn't necessarily constitute it's the best or even accurate for that matter and you lose sight of that because you are popular and that's what creates mainstream standards they're not bound in reality they are a standard created by popularism and I fear sometimes I do that too I mean, like, it's, I'm a human being too, but it's been a while. It's been a while since I've been part of that collective where it just so happens my identity and my enjoyment is just summarized by mainstream game, game design. Uh, the closest I've ever gotten in that is 
I really love World of Warcraft when it was around, right? When I was doing that. And uh, RTSs, real time strategy games, and JRPGs. They were there were heights. There there were peak golden years. Like when you talk about this, you didn't need to explain very much. You say I'm playing Final Fantasy, and anyone who's ever seen, uh, un- like talked about or played a Final Fantasy game, they had this instant connection. There's no explanation, no discussion, and in my opinion, it's intellectually boring. But emotionally rewarding. Most thing in my uh, also uh, maybe a slight hot take is that most things that are emotionally rewarding is intellectually boring. It's not intellectually intriguing or challenging or um, helping you develop or learn or grow as a person. They're they're very inversely proportional to each other. So while you can feel heart warmy. Comfortable and nice, you're learning less and less and less. When you learn a lot and struggle and like you have no idea what you're doing, your emotional intelligence go down. Like your emotional savory, like you feel frustrated, anger and stuff. But hey, you're learning a lot. Like you're you're growing a lot. You have to adapt incredibly. So that intellectual reward. Goes up when emotional reward goes down, usually, and it's a human condition.、Uh, it's phrased in many different ways. Obviously,、um, trying something that's really hard, and the next thing you gain, you get a lot of gains, right? But in, it's really because of the intellectual challenge and how interesting it is. It's interesting that you failed. It's interesting that it's hard. However, the big however is there's a diminished return when you make something you are very emotionally comfortable with harder. When you make something you're emotionally comfortable with harder, it becomes less and less rewarding. So if you get really good at something, say you get really good at Souls game, you play another Souls game, it's like oh it has to get harder. We need it even harder so I can get reward. That reward is even less rewarding the second time around, the third time around, because you actually aren't learning more. You're learning as least as possible while it's still being comfortable. Playing a different game, like going from a Souls game to a puzzle game, it's like WTF. How do I get to play? How do I get in the mindset of a puzzle game? Every single second, you want to quit the game, but you still power through. You are astronomically learning more in that situation. Your intellectual reward is off the charts. Your emotional reward is gone. It's just sapped out of nowhere because you don't want to play the game anymore, right? But you still do it.、Uh, that's usually life pleasures is countered by life obligations. Active challenges are countered by passive challenges. A passive challenge is to make money, to get a job. An active challenge is choosing what kind of job. For example, getting a job you choose, but then you go into passive. Or like, for example, you choose to beat a game as opposed to needing to finish a day's work at a job. One's passive, one's active, and it takes away from each other. And it's also inversely correlating to how you feel in rewarding intellectual reward and、uh, emotional reward. Jobs are typically and more likely to be intellectually rewarding, but emotionally not rewarding compared to choosing to play a video game. Because the video game you choose tend to be emotionally rewarding, and because it's emotionally rewarding, generally speaking, you're playing within your comfort zone, so you are less likely to apply yourself. In a job, you're more likely to be obligated to do something you didn't think you want to do or didn't know you had to do. You didn't have any control over it. The odds of a job challenging you intellectually is far greater than the odds of a video game you choose. 
And it's even lower if you choose a mainstream game. Because a mainstream game is used to draw in the largest audience and it's agreeable to the largest audience. What FromShelf did was unprecedented in my opinion. They came out of a design that tries to lower emotional reward as much as possible by making the game hard, you know, like high, high fail rates. It was a game for a time that no one asked for. And then they popularized it. Is that that's great? So it is possible to normalize certain designs. Uh, and then now I'm just going to take it back because we're going to probably mark this under a digression at this point. Um, this RGG represents, they're close to that point where they have to decide whether uh, intentionally or not, they have to decide if they're going to make their game mainstream or not. And when they do, Yakuza 4 and Yakuza 5 will likely not exist. Like the, the, the design language of 4 and 5 will give way to something else. Because in my opinion, not, not my feelings, in my, like just in my opinion, the design language of this is not popular right now. It just isn't. And that's what makes it interesting to talk about for me. Uh, because the, I can't have this discussion with a mainstream game. What do I talk about? Oh, this is basically like this game, which is basically like this game, which they release like every three years and it's very successful. You can't talk about a game as mainstream because it has most of the design languages of mainstream games. It makes them successful and very popular. I can talk at forever about this because it's unique to RGG because you don't make games like this anymore. Not for the time being. If they stuck to their guns, which I could see RGG doing, like sticking to their guns. I don't think the Sega publishing group has a history of <clears throat> sticking to their guns over time. Like even Sonic had to, the Sonic team had to like matriculate and incorporate things. And uh, I haven't played the other Yakuza games, but I'm seeing it <clears throat> even before playing it that it's getting closer to that. Like, I kind of like it because I'm a main, I, I have mainstream desires too. Like, uh, as much as I want to 100% all the mini games again, you don't really have to do that anymore because it's a modern standard. How, how do you lower the threshold of completing this game? You don't ask to do it, right? That's like Yakuza 4 is a great example. The Steam achievements are closer to the modern standards than the game itself. Like to 100% this game would take just as long as uh, like Yakuza 0, uh, more or less. But Yakuza 0 was a compromise. They wanted to capture an introduction of what makes Yakuza big, which is the 100%ing and the crazy amount of activities that you have to complete in its entirety, but at the same time streamlining Yakuza 5 storytelling, right? So you get a little bit of old Yakuza and uh, uh, more the future of new Yakuza. And then as it's going, it gets even more. Yeah, like uh, what I was about to say about um, when we start Yakuza 6, I will likely complete Yakuza 6 before Yakuza 5. Because the modern standard for Yakuza 6 is really low. Kiwami 2 is kind of ironic because uh, someone came to my stream earlier and talked about that they played like a dragon games and they specifically point out that kiwami 2 was really atrocious and torturous or takes a really long time kiwami 2 is the modern standard it took the least amount of times and in fact i like 30 to 40 percent of it was bootstrapped with very little refinement 
it was no trial and error. Like it's a, it was really fast. Like Kiwami 2 was just smooth sailing and that's the modern standard. It's great. Every moment is very meaningful. Every moment is well tuned. Uh, it's responsive. It's kind of ironic because what constitutes as responsive to a person is whatever they're used to. So if you go from Kiwami 1, which have different styles, and go to Kiwami 2, the first thing they're going to say is, I love my styles. The first thing I'll say is, you mean you like the idea of styles? Because what they did was they streamlined all the utility that most people use and took away the styles, as in like in flavor. You don't have to swap styles anymore to do all the efficient moves that you would have done from those different styles. It's kind of like saying, I'm, I, I'll advertise myself as four different people. Okay. So because I'm four different people, I'm fascinating. And then you find out that I'm one person pretending to four people. And now I'm no longer interesting because I'm no longer those four people. It's like you're still those four people. It just compartmentalized those things. So like Yakuza 4 would be, oh man, it's still not as good as Kiwami 1 because all four of the characters don't have four styles. It's like, can you, I mean, those are four characters and there are four styles. And Kiryu just happens to have the fighting style of all four of those characters. So regardless of your emotional baggage and sentimentalism, the facts are the game design did not change. You are emotionally gaslighting yourself to thinking that a specific flavor changes the way the game plays. However, instead of trying to convince them what they feel, because no, you don't want to gaslight. In my opinion, I discourage gaslighting people to changing their opinion and their feelings. I was trying to figure out what was it then? It's definitely not the styles and the moves because most of Kiwami 2 streamlined all the moves that the vast majority of people don't use and they keep the moves that it did move, uh, keep so it flows, right? One flows into another. One, You don't have like this jank where like, okay, I can't do anything to this guy lying on the ground because this character's style doesn't have anything for that or you can go back to the style things like oh i need to switch to the style so i can do it on the ground well they just remove that they just now you don't have to switch styles you just do it it's one person that's kind of the idea so um i lost my original train of thought unfortunately it's it's a point of perspective oh yeah looking for what really is so i started thinking maybe it's the change in the dragon engine. That's what my first thought is. So basically how collision models work, how the hurt boxes work, and how momentum works. Because that could fundamentally change what didn't fundamentally change, which are the moves. Like the idea of how many moves you can do, how it's structured is identical. Like what I mean is it's they streamlined. It's not like identical in the sense that um, one has less moves and one has more moves. But those moves were streamlined in a way that there's it. It would if you detach yourself from your sentimentalism, you would real. It, it would be very obvious that oh heck, all these flow now. You can kick a lot of butt really fast. But what was it about the butt kicking that made it didn't sit well? Well, it's not the one-for-one -one, uh, lifting of moves, the moveset. It's probably the engine. The way frames work is slightly different. Like, it's different enough that this person doesn't feel like they have the same control anymore. And that's fair. I, I think that's a fairer assessment. So it happens so often with sequels. It happens so often with franchises. And the remark that I made to such a person was that 
what does RGG do every time? And then if you feel like you're frustrated by this and you feel like RGG should not do this, what do they typically do? Like how, how are you surprised by this? Or how do you have emotional expectations that can cause you to view a game negatively? Well, in RGG standards, there's no indication that fighting styles, design language, and the actual like mechanics and the timing and stuff ever stay the same between games. In fact, it's one of my favorite aspects of understanding what RGG does. They constantly slightly tweak. Maybe it's just a coincidence because they're always trying something new, but it is constantly slightly different to the point it will never sit well to someone who doesn't understand who they're playing like the game that they're playing the creators of the game that they're playing it's kind of like going into uh what is this like sentimentalism argument um about expectations it's like uh i hate cats so i'm going to the theater to watch a cat movie knowing i think i hate cats What's going to happen? You're going to hate the cats. What What else were you going to say? Like what what are you going to learn from that? You learn nothing in my opinion. You you confirm something, you confirm that you hate cats. Great. Nice. So if you ever want to have an intellectual conversation with me and try to tell me something intellectually, Unless you're just looking for affirmation and feelings, that's fair. Like, if you're there to share your feelings, I have no disagreements with that. But it is not intellectually enlightening. You're not profound and you're not sharing reality if what, how you evaluate things is from your lens only. Because when you tell someone, like, oh, yeah, th this game, not as good. Because uh, uh, they decided to change this up. Like, okay, so what are you telling me about the game? That's uh, like, are you telling me something that's true that I can use to inform my decision? No, you're not. You're just sharing your opinion. If you're my friend, it means something to me. If I trust you, it means something to me. I get to know your opinion. It does not reflect on the developer or the executive, in my opinion. By coincidence, it could be true, and lots of people agree with you. That still does not reflect or give you insight to the developer or executive. You rarely put your um, feet in their position. Like, what do they usually do? What are the facts? Well, in RGG standpoint, the combat always changes. There's no reason to ever expect that you play a sequel and it doesn't change fundamentally. Even to the point where I am kind of... I want to applaud RGG for taking the brave step of making Yakuza Like a Dragon, which is number seven, a turn-based game. Like, how fundamentally can you make it different? You get rid of the whole system. And then still try to capture the system by changing the timing of the thing they literally changed the timing it went from a turn-based game to and then people are like oh it doesn't play the same anymore it's not live and my favorite moves are gone as i know they're not your your input is different what's different from timing things not timing things that's still a different approach to changing the timing what is it? It's still a like a dragon game. But if you ask someone who's emotionally gaslighting themselves to thinking they are the reason why games exist and games should be made, they would say, that's not my Yakuza. It's not my like a dragon. It's like, well, it was never yours to begin with, in my opinion. Like, factually, reality, you do not own like a dragon. You play something that's a privileged position by people who create the game you are not the creator of the game 
So it would be very encouraging and profound and useful if you are a person who's able to speak and evaluate on the vision of something you love. Not something you think you create, but you actually don't. So things like, man, this game would be so much better if they did this and this and this. It's like you, you don't make this game. You, that's non-constructive. Like you're sharing your opinion. That's great. Like say, I think it would be better with this and this, but then I need to know what the developers want. Because if I say the games would be better doing this, why didn't the developers think this way? Can you tell me why the developers choose not to do it this way? And then contrast it with yourself. Then you can say, oh, I get it. So if I do it my way, the developers would have to give up their vision of this way. So if we had to compromise, I would say the developer makes a good point here and I make a good point here. So what if we took a little from this idea and this idea and make a new thing? That would be profound, self-constructing, standardized because there are things to compare. But instead, it's just opinions, like opinion, one-sided opinions. And I call those op-eds. I don't know what other people call them. But whenever you see a change, policy, lots of current events recently, if it's one-sided opinions, it's not constructive in my opinion. It's an affirmation of something that that person believes in. And that's, you're entitled to that. It helps you feel secure, what have you. You get paid for it. You're probably very successful for being very opinionated. But it's non-constructive. One-sided arguments are non-constructive. To be constructive, you have to reach interpersonally. So, for example, you can even have a conversation with yourself. Is it constructive until you can figure out how you're feeling now? So, for example, you could say you're the best player ever. I don't know, in Fortnite or something. You're the best player in Fortnite. It's like, but are you? Have you had a discussion with yourself? Like, what is the facts from a best... What would the best Fortnite player look like? And if you know that... Then you can compare it to what you think is the best Fortnite player, which is you. So you have nothing to compare it with. It's non-constructive. You have no interpersonal comparisons. There are no standards. Standards are not grounded because they have no foundation. Like most of the standards that people expect have no foundation. Here's a great, here's a great hot take what is the foundation of a video game the developer's vision do you even know the developer's vision if you don't your opinion is foundationless there's no amount of criticism or review that you have if you have no foundation like this game sucks compared to the developer's vision like, what, what are you comparing it to? It's like, oh, this other game I arbitrarily... So not the developer's vision. It's your opinion of another game. You're comparing your opinion of another game to your opinion of the current game. So you're comparing a foundationless standardized expectation review to another foundationless expectation review and, and sell it off as a way to evaluate a product. I... I can't see the merits in that other than making you feel really good, making other people feel really great, making other people trust you and love you. Mercy's, you know, uh, uh, what'd you call it? Uh, uh, was it, uh, just, you know, bad feelings deserve companies and good feelings deserve companies. So it makes you very popular. It makes you very sensational. It's not constructive. But please, please. Like, I, I know it sounds really straightforward, like, cold and whatnot. Is It doesn't have to be constructive. I'm not saying construct constructive criticism is the gold standard. 
but selling it as constructive criticism when you have no foundations to compare it to is not constructive. And making people, misleading people to tell them that it is constructive can, can hurt more people than help. And that's kind of how a video game evaluation happens nowadays. It's like, oh yeah, someone asked me for an opinion about this game. I'll tell them what I think to the best of my ability. I'll tell the people to the best of my ability, when I play this game, what do I think the developers want to do? And then tell them how I feel about that design choice and what I want from that design choice. And then explain that the developers are probably not going in that direction. And one thing I like is I really like the design language of Yakuza 4 and 5, but there is no amount of data that I would say is suggesting strongly that they are keeping to this direction. It's sad, bittersweet for me personally, but I do not sideline the developer's intent, what they need to do, what is expected of them, and it gives weight to them. And it also opens a dialogue because if the developer says, nah, nah, you're way off your high horse, I get a chance to talk to them. You know, that that's where the constructive criticism becomes. But no, instead, nowadays is, I really like this. What What is the most hot topic stuff that people sell these days? Like personal opinion tier lists, like lists. So what what is what is your opinion on this? It's like, well, I don't like it. Take it or leave it. Yeah, it feels like a seven out of ten. And like I still do that. I, I participate in it. It's a very fun thing to do. So I give these numbers, but it is it is so much less it's so much less uh de emphasized. Like I've de emphasized that. You can't really like, what does that number even mean? I, I don't really know. Because for me, I've always said this constantly. What's your favorite game right now? The, the game I'm playing. Is this game enjoyable? I'm playing it right now. So, yes. Like, is this game... Uh, how, do you like this game? It's like, well, I mean, if I don't like it, I wouldn't be playing it right now. So is this game, what would you give this game? A 10 out of 10 because I'm playing it right now. It's like, well, do you ever give a game like bad remarks? It's like, well, yes. And I give it a 10 out of 10 because I hate it. This is an experience that is different. Now I do give lower scores, but the lower scores is from the perspective of the consumer. And um, the lower scores is from the perspective of the majority consumer trying to understand the developers. So for example, I kind of from this game, from Yakuza 0 to Yakuza 4, I understand RGG well enough in those weird periods and whatnot that I would say it's pretty confident that I can say something about what RGG has made or intended to make that may or may not resonate with the consumer, which may or may not reflect me. So I tend to differentiate where I agree with the common consumer and then where I don't agree with the common consumer. And I've evaluated to the best of my ability what RGG has made and their intended vision and then score based on that. If they overlap completely, then it's a 10 out of 10. If it doesn't overlap well, you start subtracting points. This game, which I'll evaluate after we finish, which we should get going, all the a lot of these remarks will be repeated. But that's where we're going to stop for the digression. I don't know what I'm going to title this, though. Anyways. Looking at different tier lists is kind of fun for me, especially when a few experienced people have completely different tier lists of the, of the same purpose. You know what that tells me? When the tier list is not the same, just slight hot take, we'll digress it uh, maybe in the future about different tier lists. When a tier list, 
varies incredibly, it's the most interesting thing ever. It's, it's a great, interesting product. If the tier list is exactly identical, it's super balanced, it's consistent, it's boring. And what I mean by boring is it uh, is mainstream. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like, it's consistent. That means it's not interesting anymore. You don't have to look for anything. Everyone agrees. Everyone agrees. That boring. Not the boring that makes you feel like you're depressed. It's boring as in if everybody typically agrees on the same thing, it's super consistent. It's a, It meets expectations. So you don't have to talk about anything. Everyone agrees. It's just... That, that's it. And that would mean that the developers did really well, though. It would mean that they had a consistent design, and if it's really popular, it's considered mainstream. But the opposite is, if it's completely different, it's controversial. So you can dig deep as heck, because people can't agree. It's controversial. That's super interesting. What the heck? How can are you playing the same game kind of situation? Like I'm playing this game and you're playing this game and we have no overlapping comments. That has got to be some of the most interesting products ever. That's, that's kind of with enough context, but we're talking about video games here. So there are other situations that we're talking about, like product reliability. There, there are ones that are double standards. They don't like, we're talking about creative products like products that are just bound by subjectivity as opposed to does this food have poison or not we can probably agree that we all would favor food that isn't poison we're not talking about those things not not like bound by they, they're not they can't be flexible like not objective stuff we're talking about subjective stuff and tier lists that's why I still watch tier list, by the way. Like, I, I just made a, like, a kind of, I threw some shade at influencers who do tier lists of their own opinions. No, that's a really wonderful resource. I'm not saying it's a bad or a good thing. In fact, if they continue to do that, you can take five people's tier lists and compare them. And that's how I figure out what's interesting to talk about. It's the meta of the tier list. So when a tier list varies, like you said, Worm, I typically focus on those things. Because the other stuff, you could just have one tier list. Just look at one tier list and you just say that and it, everyone's on the same page. That's your experience with Brawlhalla. There's barely anything people agree on universally. I wonder how it is in other... I mean, Brawlhalla is great. I, it, it's a controversial it keeps drawing more popularity so it tracks a lot it's very accessible um there's a thing about uh, platform brawlers that is quite an ingenious way to like capture controversy while also catering to loyalty well that that's another big game design thing but i haven't done anything that would Make me talk about that too often. All right, let's refocus. And we got to do this victory lap. 